Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. We're not going to be talking about a single game today, but rather an issue. This is an issues video. I have done them in the past. I haven't done one for a while on this channel, but that's because I haven't had anything that I wanted to rant and rave about. I do today. It has to do with a tweet. Now, I'm not usually somebody to take 280 characters and spin a 10 minute video out of that. I think that's a lot of wasted effort. 280 characters isn't really worth it. But this particular tweet really speaks to an issue that I have had with the games industry for a long time now. This is something that I've wanted to talk about for years. Well, I have been meaning to talk about for years, but haven't really had the opportunity to. I think that this tweet existing is a good segue into it because it is topical. It will continue to be topical for quite some time. And I wanted to get my thoughts out there. So this tweet comes to us from David Jaffe, the game developer and a publisher or producer or whatever he is. Uh, and he was in discussion with another person, just a regular gamer person, who was a little bit miffed that the PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5 version of Ghost of Tsushima was a paid-for upgrade or something or other. You don't get the free upgrade as other publishers have done. So in the transition between the console generations, a lot of publishers have offered free updates to games for the PS5 version if you already own the PS4 version. This gamer person expected that they'd do the same with Ghost of Tsushima, especially since they were also releasing the uh, the Icky Island DLC for a premium as well and didn't get that. So they were a little bit miffed about that. And David decided to argue with them about that. Now I'm going to read his tweet in whole. I'll also post it up on the screen so you can read along as I do. But to read it through, no offense, I appreciate that you would like that. As in, like the idea of a free upgrade from PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5. No offense, I appreciate that you would like that. I would like Disneyland to be a lot less expensive. But gamers demand the best visuals, the longest games, no MTX microtransactions, free DLC. When does it end? Now, I don't care too much about the general discussion that David and this gamer were having. It doesn't really bother me. Um, in, in terms of the cost of upgrading games from PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5, if publishers want to do that, then that's great. Thumbs up for them and all that stuff. But that's really a consumer discussion point. That's talking about video games as a product. And that's really not what I'm interested in. It's certainly not what I've based my entire coverage of video games about. And it's not something I'm going to start talking about here. I don't care. People have their own opinions on that. And there are plenty of opinions out there. That is a conversation that is done to death, and that's great. So, yeah, that, that's not the, top, the topic of this video. This video, though, I want to talk about the second half of David's tweet because it speaks to an attitude within the video game industry that really bothers me, and it bothers me more and more the longer it goes on because it's not being challenged. It should be. It's not true, and it does come across as quite deceptive from the people that say it. So I'll read that second half of the tweet out again. But gamers demand the best visuals, the longest games, no microtransactions, free DLC. When does it end? That part of David's tweet I have a very big issue with. The point that David's making is quite simple. He's just saying that because game developers are forced to make these AAA blockbuster games because that's what the gamers want, where does the money come from? If people aren't willing to pay for microtransactions, and fair enough, people shouldn't be paying for microtransactions, and if people aren't going to pay for DLC, which I don't agree with, people are more than happy to pay for DLC if it adds value. If people aren't willing to pay for those things, though, is what David's saying, where does the money to make these games come from? That argument is kind of whatever, and I do understand the basic principle that if you make a game for $500 million, you kind of need to make $800, $900 million back for it to have been worthwhile, worth the risk. But... What I have an issue with is this characterization that this is the way that games must be made. That's a lie. That is just a plain place lie that the AAA industry wants everyone to believe so it can continue to make the games this way. But in reality, it just doesn't play out that way. Because if gamers really did insist on games being made this way, if that was the only way that games could be made, then there wouldn't be successful games made in other ways. And that is untrue. The idea that gamers want the best quality graphics, the longest games, completely is completely undermined when you realize 
that there are a lot of games that are very successful that are very short or have very simple graphics. You don't need photorealism to make a game that sells a million copies. You don't need a 50 hour game when people are willing to spend full price to buy a game at that that's five, 10 hours long if it is of a high enough quality. And I'm going to run through a lot of games here that are all million dollar sellers and really undermine the point that David's making here. Stardew Valley was developed by one person and it has very simple graphics. It looks like a Super Nintendo game, as a lot of people will say. It has sold more than 10 million copies and that is with the developer constantly working on it. He's added multiplayer in there. He's done a lot with Stardew Valley from its origins to where it is now and has been rewarded for that with $10 million. There are a lot of AAA games that don't sell 10 million copies. Sorry, not $10 million, 10 million copies. There are a lot of AAA games that don't get to that number. Another game came out last year, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. It was made by two people. It has graphics that are fine. People really thought it was quite pretty, especially the 3D section, but it certainly wasn't a Ghost of Tsushima. And it sold a million units which for a development team of two people is really impressive. Uh, Hades won all these Game of the Year awards. It was the kind of the indie darling of last year. And it uh, sold very well. As far as I'm aware, it sold over a million units. There we go. Over a million units. And it was made by a team that didn't need to crunch. They didn't need to crunch. They were given perfectly normal working hours. It was a small team. They created this very creative vision that people couldn't shut up about for weeks and weeks. Then we've got Hellblade. So, what, three years ago now, Ninja Theory produced Hellblade. It sold over a million copies. It's a very short game. I think you can complete it in five or six hours from memory. And while it certainly has the AAA production values, because that's what Ninja Theory was capable of doing, it was a very independent, creative project that was certainly not triple a in terms of the longest number of hours to play then we've got limbo limbo was what released a decade ago almost now it sold over a million copies as well this humble little 2d platformer that has inspired a lot of other creative efforts and has become part of the lexicon of video games especially in the indie space another million dollar another million copy seller then we've got Super Hot. Now, Super Hot certainly doesn't look like Call of Duty, but because it had that really creative essence to it, that stuff only moves when you move, it has sold over a million units. The VR version alone sold over 800,000 units, which for VR was pretty impressive. There aren't that many VR units out there. And it has been an indie hit. Once again, it has also been enormously influential. There are all kinds of games that are now using a similar mechanics to Super Hot. Again, not a AAA game. Then we've got Crossy Road, the humble little mobile game Crossy Road, which has ended up in arcades on the Apple TV, on consoles, on everybody's phone. It made $10 million in revenue from in-app purchases alone, and it was very generous about that. It wasn't asking you to pay money, it just earned it. Another very humble little Frogger type game with blocky graphics. Certainly not a AAA game. Uh, Shantae just to prove that you can actually build an entire business around these games as well. Shantae has, what, five games now, six games or something like that. It has been around since like 1990s. I think the first one was released in 2002. It's been around for almost 20 years now and it has been very much the kind of cornerstone of WayForward's business. It has sold over 3 million units. Once again, these are 2D platformers that certainly don't have the AAA production values that David is suggesting is essential because that's what gamers want. The thing is, the AAA industry wants you to believe that this is what gamers want because this is what the AAA industry wants to sell you. But in reality, gamers, for the most part, just want good games to play. They don't necessarily care how the game looks. They don't necessarily care if it has the AAA production values. Yes, of course, lots of people like Ghost of Tsushima, lots of people like Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption, whatever. People like those games. I'm not denying, denying that. But I'm not saying that... What I'm saying is that it's not essential to people's ability to play video games. People are much more willing 
to pick up things that are much more humble than the AAA industry wants you to believe. And why does the AAA industry want you to believe this? Because, because games that cost $500 million to make are good for shareholders. They prop up the wealth and value of a business. You create a $500 million game, it's worth a lot more to the stockholders than if you create a $50,000 game. Independent game developers also don't list on the stock exchange, so there's no way for shareholders, there's no way for investors to capitalize on these organizations and to capitalize on these games. You can keep your independent studio independent, creative and separate from the kind of the, the investment scene and still create these great games, but because the shareholders, the investors, the big CEOs don't profit from that, they don't want you playing those games. So this idea that game developers have to make these games is a myth that is perpetuated by the people making them because that benefits them, not the gamers. The gamers don't benefit from it. They don't necessarily want it. They just play it because that's what's shoved in front of them. And I can't help but think that if we got rid of this AAA blockbuster nonsense, and there are very few games in the AAA space that are genuinely worth playing, if we got rid of all of that and we introduced people to a much broader range of games, I think those people would be much more partial to those games than we think. The general perception is that a lot of people will only play games like Call of Duty, the big AAA blockbuster sports games, Red Dead Redemption, whatever Jeff Jeffy's producing. The perception is there that they'll only play those games. But I don't think that's the case. I think if people were directed towards playing other games, they kind of discover that they don't need photorealistic games to enjoy playing video games. That's my thoughts anyway. I really do think that this AAA industry is a very nasty deception that is self-perpetuating. They tell gamers what gamers want and then they kind of do everything in their power to make the gamers play those things rather than go out and discover something else to play. Those are my thoughts anyway. Do let me know your own thoughts in the comments. Let's have a good chat about this because it is a topic that is worth discussing. As somebody that really cares about independent games and the artistry of video games, I don't like the idea that the only thing that people who play games want are this tiny series of criteria that just happens to benefit the people at the very top of Activision or Ubisoft or whatever. The people wearing the suits, you know, this is what the AAA industry is here for. It's for the people wearing the suits. It's not for anybody else, for the shareholders, than the CEOs and other executives. And I don't think, I, I really don't think that that is of benefit to gamers. I don't think that's really what they want. I think ultimately at the end of the day, what gamers want is just good games to play. And if we give them a chance to discover that there are good games to play that aren't triple A's, then that will undermine a lot of the rhetor rhetoric of the triple A industry. Anyway, that's enough for this video. Like I said, it was a bit of a rant, but it is a topic I'm passionate about, as you can probably guess. Do let me know your thoughts. Let's have a good chat about that, like I said. If you do enjoy my videos, please do back me on Patreon. You can do so for a dollar a month. And by doing so, you get my digital magazine each month. You also get the visual novels that I create, which are not triple A's. <laughs> They're independent projects, um, <laughs> of course. But yeah, you, you get a lot for backing me on Patreon. And of course, you also support what I'm doing with this YouTube channel and digitallydownloaded.net. You can also mash that like and sub subscribe button to make sure that you don't miss a video as I upload them because I do get in a rhythm sometimes and do upload a lot. So I would hate for you to miss a video that you might otherwise be interested in. Okay, thank you as always for tuning in. We will see you next time.